Are you enjoying this pre-summer summer? The pre-summer warm-up, right? The warm-up has begun. I don't know what we would label this. It's definitely not one of the winners I was hoping for, like Blackberry or something like that. Maybe we still have an opportunity for Blackberry winter. Um, this morning, we are glad you're with us. Um, we're excited to get together and worship the Lord. I hope you've come ready today to worship. Um, if you all pray hard, maybe I'll preach fast, and uh, we'll beat the Methodists to the lunch line. Amen. Well, I just want to tell you that I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be with you. I'm excited to look out and see the crowd uh, dispersing and growing. I'm hoping that, you know, maybe by, by July that we'll have everything back full bore, but we'll have to wait and see and see how it goes. But in the meantime, if you've come ready to worship, I'd ask Brother Tony to come on and get us where we need to be, sir. Beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love you are beautiful beyond description majesty enthroned above sing with me and i stand i stand in awe of you i stand i stand in awe of you I stand in awe of you. Let's sing it again. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. Yes, I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due. I stand in you pray with me father we stand in all of you and your greatness the might and the power that you have thank you father for being god and yet loving us even when we don't deserve it we ask father you would inhabit our praise this morning fill our hearts with the knowledge that comes from the scripture that we're about to hear fill our minds with the love that comes just from you give us the peace that passes all understanding as we spend time together here in your presence this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's find a hymn book. We have hymn books now, right? 429. We're going to sing, All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus. <clears throat> Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious, oh, how blessed to call him mine, all oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus, he is more than life to me. Wonderful. 
for redemption never can a mortal Verse 5, by the crystal flowing river, with the ransomed I was seen, and forever and forever, praise and glorify the King, all that thrills my soul is He. morning. Um, I don't know about you all, but it's really bothering me that every time I turn on the news or look at the internet or check my phone that there's something bad going on. Um, I was reading uh, Matthew 24 this morning, trying to find a uh, a little bit of inspiration on what I wanted to say. And it basically says these are the birthing pains. The things that we're going through. But then it referred me to this scripture. And uh, I hope we can all find peace in this scripture. And also realize that God is telling us what to do if we want to heal ourselves. Second Chronicles seven fourteen, If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Thank you, Sharon. Won't you turn with me to hymn number 296. And let's stand together and sing the first two verses of Jesus is Lord of all. 296. Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life. My hope, my glory, my all. Wonderful Master in joy and in strife. On Him you Sing again. Be seated, please.
Thank you. Only song I know that says Raise Your Ebenezer. I'll have to study that again to even remember that. Um, how, how, how many of you are ready this morning? Have, have you been prepped by the song service? And, and just being here, how many of you felt good getting a hymnal out again? Amen. Y'all sounded so good this morning. Um, I'm glad that we went ahead and did that. And thank you everybody that helps out around here to make sure things go off as, as they do. And so... Uh, I'd like to begin just with a word of prayer before we get into the message this morning. Father God, in Jesus' most powerful and precious name, I come to you this morning and I just thank you for the song service and the worship service and the intention of the singers and the intention of the hymns and the, the writers and Father, the, the, the pianist and, and, and Father, just everything has brought us to this place of worship. Father, I pray that we are prepared for worship, that we have our mind where it needs to be and our heart where it needs to be so that we can hear from you on high. Father, we would love to have one or two words from you in power than a multitude of words, Father, that don't hit your mark this morning. So I pray that you would uh, make me adequate for this calling of preaching your word. Father, the the singing has got us where we need to go. The, the focus was, was on point, Father. The, the pianist, everything has got us to this place. Now, Father, I pray you'll continue your marvelous ministry here and that your word would be preached in such a way that it would be understood and that it would be something that we need this morning. Father, feed us from on high. And I ask this as your minister in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I tell you, it's a scary task sometimes to come up here and, and know that the children of God are, are to receive something from God. And you think, well, then maybe somebody different should be standing here. Um, and so I just pray the Lord's power this morning and His authority as we get into this. So, so I've been kind of looking on the, the purposes and the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. We began this at Easter. I had a list that I kind of read off that I had written that just things that I've recognized in my life that the Holy Spirit has done. And then I decided, or the, or the Spirit led me, I should say, because that always makes it um, more appropriate. The Spirit led me to just go ahead and preach down this list. And so we've been looking at some of the things that I have recognized 
that the Spirit of God does in my life. And then there's Scripture that kind of goes with that. I, one of the things I do is I read the Bible, then I get an expectation, and I see the, the, the reaction of the Holy Spirit, or, or I, I'm able to see things in the past that He has done that the Bible says, hey, He does this. And I'm like, hey, that's right. He does. I've seen this in my own life. And so... This morning, uh, the, the line I had written down is, When I am wayward, he whips me. Mm, I didn't get an amen one on that, did I? <laughs> so you come to church this morning, and I'm going to talk about the discipline of the Lord in our life. And Susan asked me this morning before we were leaving, and, and, and she was thinking about saying it. She said, what's the message on this morning? I said, the discipline of the Lord. She said, you need to change that. And that I could get up here and change it to anything and people would be happy. Amen? Um, because who wants to hear about those things? Well, the truth of the matter is we need to hear about those things because we are, as His children, disciplined like it or not. It is part of the, the life that we live as Christians. And when we get wayward, He whips us. Now, I like to say that He whips us in a way that it doesn't show. He doesn't leave bruises, but we know it was Him. Amen? He can straighten us out. So we're going to go into a text in Hebrews chapter 12. But before we get there, i like to give you just a little bit of background on where we're at. Now most of you know Hebrews chapter 11. It's the faith chapter. It's a chapter that tells us about Abraham and, and all these other giants of the faith that the Hebrew nation looked back upon and, and they saw that they trusted God and they reacted and did what God asked them to do. But life wasn't always easy for these people. It was a struggle. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they did not see the land that they were promised. A, hand, a land not made by hands. And so we see that service of our Lord is a right now thing in our lifetime. But we may not get the end result in our lifetime of the thing that we're working for. And we see that things begin and they continue on in Scripture for millennia, building up and building up to the promises of our Lord. So chapter 11 is full of the fathers and the heroes, if you will, of the faith. And then we get into chapter 12, and it starts with a therefore in the translation that I'm reading. So that should always be an indication that we're part of a central theme and thought. When you see a therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. And, and so as we study, verse, chapter 12, verse 1 starts with, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin which so easily entangles. Now, if you go back further in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews is establishing the superiority of Christ over everything. It's establishing the superiority of Christ over anything that the Hebrew children would have seen as God's, God's power, God's glory, God's purpose, God's things, no matter what they had. So you had the law given by Moses, Christ is superior. So you have, you have the law that the angels were involved, Christ is superior to the angels. You have the prophets from the Old Testament, Christ is superior. You had the law, the grace of Christ is superior. So all through the first part of this book, it's reminding them, and, and especially that a lot of them were, were, were kind of backing away from Christianity and going back to temple worship because they always believed that no matter what happened, the temple is going to be involved in it. But they didn't understand that God was building a new temple made of flesh, made of stones that are alive, not stones that are going to be established on a platform that He lives in our life now, something that had never happened before. And so, so the writer of Hebrews is trying to get them from going back to temple worship which has uh, sacrifices that were fulfilled in Christ and has the shedding of blood that was fulfilled in Christ. And, and now the Bible says that Christ has sat down at the right hand of the Father. His, his time of sacrifice, which is something no temple priest ever did. He didn't sit down because the offerings were ongoing and they were a picture of what Christ was going to fulfill and be. And so he's writing to these Hebrew believers and letting them know that Christ is superior. Christ is superior, which is one of the things that Paul ran into in his life. So many people didn't like that he was saying, yes, the law of Moses is of God and good, but Christ is better. As a matter of fact, he said when, when the Jews today still read the, the law of Moses, there was a veil over their eyes that they could not see the revelation of Christ who is superior. He is the fulfillment. So he's writing to these people and he reminds them of the people that came before and that these folks had struggles and these folks had issues and things they had to fight with because, um, you know, we are 
forgiven in Christ. And those of us that believe that have come to him for the forgiveness of sins, we are believers. But just like that one centurion in the New Testament said, Lord, I believe, help thou me mine unbelief. Now, we don't live in a state of unbelief, but we do have occasions of unbelief and doubt. And, and, and you, know, you hear people say, well, I don't, I don't have any unbelief at all. I don't have any doubt. Well, have you ever complained? If you've ever complained, that means you doubt the goodness of God in this situation. Otherwise, you would not be complaining. You say, well, I don't like it that way. Now we're getting to discipline. We're getting to the place where the Lord corrects us in our walk. Now, the New Testament lets us know that the purposes that are going on in our lives is, I've often wondered, and when I was a young man, if, why, don't, why doesn't God just take us home the moment we get saved? Uh, it, of course, it would be hard on church service if every time we baptize somebody, they got saved, they come down, we, we baptize them, and they disappear. Baptisms would be at an all-time low, amen? But, but, if, but if God took us home the moment we were born again, then we could not live in a life of doubt. We could not wander from the truth. We could not get wayward because He could just take us home when He makes us right and it would all be good. But there's a process also involved of sanctification. God is turning us into the very images of Jesus Christ, which means everything in our life that doesn't look like Jesus needs to go. Now, now if we start reflecting, we'll start thinking, well, there's probably a few things in my life that doesn't look like Jesus. Yes, I am a complainer. Yes, I am a negative person. Yes, I am a doubter. And then we could just go into the sins of, of commission that the Bible says these things are sin. We could probably go down the list of the things the Bible says do not do and say, well, you know, I, I fall short on a few of those. I've got things in my life that don't belong. Here's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He begins to work in our life to convict us and to teach us and to show us that these things don't belong. So, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles and, and, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you do not grow weary or lose heart. So if you think that you're going through more discipline or more trouble or more strife um, than anybody else, think about Jesus before you think that way. And then the writer goes on and he brings them to mind of Proverbs chapter 3. He says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have completely forgotten this word of encouragement, the address to your father, addressed his son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those whom he loves and he chastises everyone he accepts as his son. Now, that's not a direct translation of what's written in the Hebrew, but those things, it does kind of bring out the meaning of, of what we're trying to get at. And so then he goes on, he says, endure hardship as discipline. That's a hard one to take, isn't it? Endure hardship as discipline. Endure hardship like you would discipline. It's for your good. God is treating you as his children. Think about that. The reason why God disciplines us, he's treating us as children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of Spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for good in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. May God add his blessing again to the reading of his word. So let's take a look at just a few verses in here. Um, we're we're going to focus on just, just a few of these verses. And so when I'm wayward... He whips me. He disciplines me. He, he brings me back to where I need to be. Now, now I, I, as a pastor and as a minister, have seasons of doubt. I have seasons of confusion. I have seasons of resistance to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to do that, Daddy. Anybody ever had that child? Uh, you hear the story of the child that, that kept standing up 
or kept sitting down in church. And the father said, you need to stand up. And she said, I don't want to stand up. I'm tired. We stand all the time. Now, I'm not sure what kind of church she was in, but she was weary of the standing and sitting and standing and sitting. And he said, if you don't stand up, I'm going to whip you. So she stood up and she said, Daddy, I'm sitting on the inside. Anybody have that child? Anybody have that strong-willed child that just absolutely doesn't see the reasoning for what you're doing, doesn't understand the discipline? How many of us sitting in here this morning, whether there's uh, snow on the roof or not, are that child? Lord, I know how you're leading me. I don't want to do it. Have you ever been caught in a position where the Spirit of God says, here's a good opportunity for you to witness about me? And you're like, no, this is not the situation. I need it perfect. I need them to knock on my door telling me, and telling me they want to find Jesus. And they even have their own Bible, right? I, I just, I, but, but when the Spirit of God says, be my witness, and sometimes we, we resist that. And we just say, well, I just don't want to right now. And then I've heard many testimonies from saints that stood up in pews on a testimony night and said, well, there's been many a times the Lord said, speak, and I wouldn't do it. And, and I feel conviction, and, and I feel like that, that I'm, I'm not, and I just need to testify that I have failed my Lord in not being a witness for Him in my life, and in, in by word, by deed. Uh, and, and we probably have many, many, many instances of that. So, the writer of Hebrews comes back and he says, um, starting with verse 4, In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So don't complain. Consider Jesus. And, and you're not resisting sinning in your life to the point of shedding blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? I love that again. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. And he goes on later and says, Discipline is not pleasant when it happens. How many of you remember the whooping? Did any of y'all ever have that insulting mom or dad that said, This is going to hurt me more? <laughs> right? You don't, it cannot as a child. Like, I've had your whipping before. It does not. It may be your hand, but it doesn't hurt you like it hurts me. But, but we understand as we grow and become adults and then have to administer discipline in our own life to our own family. And we realize that, yes, it's a painful thing because we love, but we love so much that we won't let them stay wayward. Our God loves us so much He won't let us stay wayward. When I'm wayward, He whips me and praise the Lord He does. He loves me too much to leave me in my sin. He loves me too much to leave me in the wickedness of my mind. He loves me too much to leave me non or complacent about life that I live in and non-conforming to his will. So listen to what it says in verse 7. That's that tricky verse that I, I stumbled over. Endure hardship as discipline. Another translation said, it is for discipline that you have to endure. Because see, discipline, having a disciplined life, it's something we should, as Christians, desire. It is something God intends for our life. A disciplined life. Now, discipline means that you've got the discipline to get up and um, go do what you need to do so that later on you can play the piano. How many of you would like to be able to sit down and play that piano like that this morning? Wouldn't that be wonderful? How many of you want to do what it takes to get there? That changes things, doesn't it? Yeah. All the time and all the effort and, 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 and going back over and keeping those fingers trained. And, you know, the, now those keys aren't numbered. Not that they do you any good anyway. But, I mean, I don't know where to start. Everybody says, well, you start at middle C. Not a clue. What music is lost on me. I love to play the radio, but I struggle with that. But, but to be able to do these things, to be able to hit the home run when the ball's pitched right, to be able to uh, run. You ever watch people play soccer? I know why soccer's late catching on here. We don't like to run like that. I mean, there's no stopping to the running, but I'm amazed at the running. I'm like, I couldn't run the field once, much less for a whole game. Endure hardship is discipline. For it, it, or in other words, it is for discipline that you endure this. As His children, we are disciplined. So one of the greatest things that when God is disciplining us, and sometimes it is a hardship, sometimes He's getting our attention, sometimes He's withdrawing the extra over-the-top blessings, you know, not the sunshine or the rain, 
but, but he withdraws that, those, those extra things so that he can get our attention. He changes the circumstances of our life to get our attention. Has, have you ever had something weird happen? To you? The car, flat tire, and you're, you're like, God, I know you're saying something. This Help me understand what you're saying. Help me to see. Sometimes the Lord's trying to get our attention. I, I was, as I told you before, I was bound and determined to be an evangelist, to be a revivalist is what I wanted to be. And I wanted to travel. And, and come in, preach three, four, five sermons, and just whip everybody up to a frenzy, then leave them for the pastor to fix. And, and I know sometimes you get an evangelist in, and he's, he's, he, instead of glorifying God, and he's, he's more like a blender in jello. Have you ever seen that? Try to put that back together, right? That just It's never going to congeal like that again. And, and some are that way. And so I wanted to be a discipling revivalist, and, and God didn't want me to do that to the point where he had to have somebody call me on the phone and say, we'd like you to be our pastor. I'm like, I wasn't thinking that way. So I looked at Susan and I said, do we want to be a pastor? So, hmm, I prayed, she prayed, come back. Yeah, God said, okay. We went and preached and stayed. I told you that just a couple of weeks ago. It's amazing how we need to endure hardship because it is the discipline that's going to make us who we need to be. God is treating us as children, for we are children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Verse 7 goes on and says, if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. So when we're in this position of being disciplined, it's because God loves us as His children. And those He doesn't mess with are not His children. He doesn't whip the children of the evil one. You remember when Jesus said, You are of your father, the devil. And they said, Oh, no, we are of father Abraham. He said, Oh, no, you're not. You're nothing like Abraham. Because Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. And what did they do? Got mad at him again. Well, you're not even 50 years old here. I thought, how could Abraham have seen your day? And here he is, God incarnate. I mean, he was there when Abraham looked up. I think that uh, Abraham saw a whole lot more than we understand about the day of Jesus. So, hardship, discipline. God is correcting us. And we should acknowledge that and accept that as hard. It's not easy. It's interesting because you're going down verse 9 and you see holiness is the purpose outcome. So, so what's the purpose in discipline? He disciplines us, first of all, because we're his children. He loves us, and that's, that's just normal. Everybody should get that that's ever had children or been a child. Now, if you've, you're in here and you've never been a child, we'll need to talk later because we might be able to make some money on your circumstances. I don't know if you were hatched or dropped off here by an alien, but nonetheless, you've either been a child or you have children. You can understand that discipline is not always easy, but there's a purposed outcome for the discipline. You understand what it is to have parents. Moreover, verse 9 says, We have all had human fathers who disciplined us and respected them for that. How much more should we submit to the Father, the Spirit, a Father of spirits, and live? He disciplined us for a little while, while the, uh, our fathers disciplined us for a little while, the way they thought best. And, and this is one of those sticklers in the, in the sermon. We can always think about somebody who was a poor or an abusive parent and say this is a bad illustration. It would be in their life, but it goes on and says, and they did what they thought was best. How many of you look back now and in the raising of your children think, you know, I could have done that just a little bit differently. Now, I know my mom's not going to raise her hand because it was perfect, right? That makes it a little bit difficult sometimes when I'm preaching a message and my mother's sitting there. There are some stories I still probably shouldn't tell. Although she's probably heard the sermon tapes and picked up on a few things. I wasn't quite the disciplined child she thought I was. But there are things that we do that we look back on, but we did the best we know how. See, we got a younger generation coming up today that just complained about the previous generation. I mean, it's funny the Gen Zers have complained about the Millennials. The Millennials didn't raise the Gen Zers. It's not, not necessarily their children. It may be, but, but what do they know about it? And we're holding everybody accountable for the world that they were, they were born into like they controlled what it was. And it's interesting that we're listening to a mind that's not yet 30 to explain to us what it means to exist in this world. Listen, everything that's happened in your life has been programmed and it's just a celebration in mediocrity. If you graduated high school, it's, most people do. It's like... You know, we have all these, this, these things, but, but here's the truth of the matter. Let's talk to the people who are older, who have had to fight for what they've had, have lost it all and started over again because nothing is handed to us. Amen? Even the blessing of the Lord, the ability to, to, to work and have strength is a blessing from the Lord. And what we do is we, get our, we lose our mindset about that and we, 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 we forget to be thankful 
for what we have. And you don't hear a lot of thanksgiving today. Uh, thanksgiving is something, being thankful is something that a lot of us are being disciplined over. More than just complaining, we're just not thankful. And we should thank you. Read Romans chapter 1, you'll see thanksgiving is an important part in God's kingdom. So the, out per, out, the purpose, outcome, is holiness. They disciplined us for a little while the way they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good. God has only your good in the intentions. As a matter of fact, the front of the bulletin says that this morning. That the things that are going on in our life are about the outcome. God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His Holiness. Now think about that. God is working in your life. He's disciplining you. He's hedging you in. He's controlling things so that you have an opportunity to, to live a life of holiness. Now like I like to say and remind you, holiness is not the opposite of sinfulness. Holiness is the opposite of common. Holy means unique. Now, a lot of times, especially in the last 50 or 60 years, that's what you've always heard. You're either sinful or you're holy. Well, you're either common, which if you had a common cup, or it's just something you go and scoop dog food with or things like that, or if you had a unique cup that you wouldn't stick into dog food. Maybe a crystal goblet that sits in, in your fine china cabinet and, and you look at that thing and you would never think about scooping out dog food or dog pen with it, but you've got to scoop just for that. One is common. And one is holy. One has a unique purpose and you're protective of it. That's who we are. That's what God desires from us is holiness. We are to be different from the ways of the world. We're not supposed to blend in and get along. We are supposed to be unique. Just as He is unique, so be you unique. So God disciplines us when we just fall into the trappings of the world. When we fall into the love of this world and things of this world, then God begins to discipline us because He wants us to be unique. He wants us to be vessels of praise. He wants us to be vessels of glory. He wants us to be vessels that worship Him in truth and sincerity. We are being disciplined so that we are holy. So there are things that you're not allowed to do. There are things that he doesn't want us to get involved with. And there's not a whole lot of preaching necessarily today. Now, all preachers say that. Nobody preaches on sin but me. We all say that. But the truth of the matter is there's a whole lot more to preach on. But while we're here, let's park a minute. The Bible still calls things sin. I don't care how you feel about it, it's still sin. I don't, I don't care how you reason it out. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. Now, in context, obviously, because there's a place in there where it says don't eat bacon. I love me some bacon, y'all. People say, how do you justify that? I've read the rest of the book. That's another problem. So, God disciplines us to make us holy, to make us unique, a peculiar people. Amen? Amen. Well, he goes on and says after that, in verse 11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So while discipline is not pleasant, it brings a bountiful crop of peace and righteousness. So think about that. So how does, how does the discipline of God bring peace and righteousness? Well, first of all, righteous means to be right with God, to be doing the thing God has asked you to do and not doing the things He's asked you not to do. So it's being right with God, having your focus on God, your life enveloped in God. And so righteousness is a thing that we can grow in, and so is peace. And have you ever noticed that? Uh, we, when somebody's passing away, a lot of times we like to ask them, have you made peace with God? It's like it's funny because it's not like you can sit down at that point and begin to barter with God. Say, okay, I'm getting ready to die. What do I got to do to get in? Right? But it's more about God made peace with us through Jesus Christ, His Son. And when we're seeing Him, He fixes that. He removes the sin, debt, the, the penalty, and the punishment for sin. But yet we do get our feet dirty in this world. We do sometimes get off the path in places we should not be with our mind and with our actions and, and, and with the lack of actions at times. Remember the Bible says there are sins of omission, things that you should do that you don't, and sins of commission, things that you should not do and you do. And those are things that we need to be resolved in with God. And He usually, at a certain point, He brings in discipline. The purpose of the discipline is peace with Him. Anybody ever been at peace with God? 
I mean, can you sit here right now in this moment and say, I'm right where God wants me to be. And I'm doing just what God wants me to do. <sighs> no, my life's not easy. Our air conditioner went out this week. It's a bad week for that. Our house was 77 when we left it. When we get back, it'll be 87. It's funny, it gets hotter inside than out. I don't know what that's about other than the attic. We had a huge attic. And a lot of our ceilings are just six, eight inches from the attic, from the roof. So they get hot. Ceiling fans, blowing hot air, hot air around. It's, it's really not perfect. Got almost 200,000 miles on her van. 150,000 miles on my dad's old truck. That um, it's a 1994. Any minute now. Any minute, right? And you're just driving along thinking how blessed we are, don't have a car payment. <laughs> Got a car payment tomorrow. So, life's not a cakewalk, is it? But I have no doubt, no doubt, that I'm right where I need to be in this moment in time. I'm where God's got me. And that's peace. Now, you know, things may go on in a minute, make me change my mind about that, I don't know. But right now, even in the struggles, God knows what he's doing, amen? Even where he places us, God knows what he's doing. And so, I find peace in that. And I, I find myself right with God. I... I you know, it's, it's not like, well, you know, everything's going good. It, it, it's interesting psalm. Psalm 73 is a complaint of a righteous man because the unrighteous get everything their way. It's a complaint all through there, the early verses. And he's like, I look around and the wicked don't suffer. And I look around and, and bad stuff doesn't happen to them. But the righteous people, they're always under the thumb of God and they're always being corrected. And the unrighteous people are overrunning the righteous people. And the psalm ends with... God knows all. He's the one that keeps score. It's not for us to keep score. And the psalmist comes to his senses before the end of the psalm that God disciplines and he corrects us. There are paths he doesn't want us to walk because of righteousness. It's interesting. Discipline, while not pleasant, it brings a beautiful crop of righteousness and peace. I'll take righteousness and peace. As I've said many times, I like closing my eyes at night and falling asleep have, knowing I haven't wronged anybody. This has not always been the truth in my life. I've several times waited for the phone call. Got one one time from ATF. They're fun to deal with. That's another story for another sermon. It's interesting though, so what do we do with it? Discipline seems ple does not, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. So what's our reasonable response to the discipline of the Lord? Live in its fruit and avoid as much sin as you can, right? Listen to what it says. Um, actually, avoid the, the discipline. So another thing about living in peace is when you're walking in righteousness, you're at peace with God because you're not walking in unrighteousness. Amen? You're not doing the things that He's convicting you about. Have you ever lived with conviction of the Lord on a day-in, day-out basis because you were not where you were supposed to be? I believe I've had a call on my life since I was little. And I was way up in my 20s before I finally said, yes, Lord. I can remember in a Awana, Awana night where we all dressed in the thing that we wanted to be. And I put on a runner suit and I said, I want to be a missionary. I want to go serve my Lord Jesus. And then I was in my late 20s before I finally said, yes, Lord. And I was married and I had to break the news to Susan. We're going into ministry. It was a wonderful day. She cried all afternoon. Because she knew what that meant. But she was willing to go and serve and do. And use her gifts and talents for his praise and glory as well. Isn't it wonderful to be where God wants you to be? There's peace in that. And the more we're where we need to be, the less discipline we have to go through. There's peace in that. Listen to what he says. How do, how do we work this out? He closes this in 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Therefore, Strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Therefore, strengthen your. You ever had a doctor say, you need to exercise? 
You ever had a doctor say, if you ever want that joint to keep working, you better work that joint. And you come back six months, you haven't done a thing, and it's his fault or her fault. You're going to lose that tooth if you don't. Your diabetes is going to remain high all the time if you don't quit. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. We, we need to work out. We need to have a focus and have a plan and have an intention of walking where God wants us to walk. If we, if we don't live with intention, we're going to miss this. We're just going to exist in this world, neither hot, neither cold. And the Bible says He just wants to spew those people out. An intention of walking in righteousness, an intention of walking with peace with God means that we need to take control over the things that we can. You can control your mind. I heard a, a, a professor speak this week and he said... You know, we complain about how we haven't gained any of our goals, but he said, my question for you is what thing can you do before the sun sets tonight that will get you at, at, at one step further down the road to where you want to be? When will you make that step? When will you get started? I don't know how many times that you know, I, I remember going into my 30s, and I said, by the time I'm 40, I'm going to be slim. 30s came and went, y'all. And I said, well, I'm in my 40s now. I'm going to lose weight before I'm 50. And then I'll be 55 June 11. I'm hoping to maybe do it before 60. But now it's a question with heart disease. Am I going to see 60, right? It's like, when are you going to make that step? When are, you, when are we going to make that step to live at peace with God, to live in righteousness? When are we going to put that forward? When are we going to do those things? Verse 13 says, make level paths for your feet. Hear that? Make level paths for your feet. We choose where we walk, don't we? I've had people, as a minister, I've had people call me in, in, in previous parts of ministry and their, their life is in an absolute hole. And it's been getting there for a few years, right? And then they call you in the hole. One day, 12 hours, two days a week from complete disaster and say, can you dig me out? You've been walking this path that's got you to this hole for 15 years. And you want me to give you a, a quip it that'll get you out by the end of the week? Well, if I tell them what the Bible says, make level paths for your feet. You want to walk a flat path? You want to walk an easy road in life? Walk the easy road, not the complicated road. I did it my way, right? A hard, school of hard knocks. How many graduated from there? Yeah. You know, the school of hard knocks is a voluntary situation most of the time. We get our place, ourselves in places that we don't need to be. Listen, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. The, anybody have trouble with hips? I, I got trouble with gout. But I got a hip flexors giving me trouble now. And it's funny, there are things that aggravate my hip flexor. You know what I do? I avoid those things as best I can. We can't always avoid those things. But the Bible tells us to strengthen our feeble arms and weak knees. We need to work out our faith. And we need to work out our, our position so that we can serve God with, with, with greater ferocity. And make level paths for our feet. Let's walk the path that he has laid out for us. If he hasn't given you hind's feet for the situation that you're in, in other words, he hasn't given you the feet of a deer, stay off the craggy rocks. If he gives you feet of a goat, then you're okay on those rocks. But if you've got feet of a cow, stay in the pasture. It's going to be better for you. We need to learn to choose the path that God has made flat for us so that we can walk in that. And then we have peace because we're walking in righteousness and we're not under the discipline of the Lord. I am so thankful that the Spirit of God disciplines me. I am so thankful that He won't leave me wayward. When I am wayward, He whips me. And I thank Him for that. Usually not in the middle of the whipping. But when I see the results, and I bet I'm talking to a group of people that have had those results, they've gotten away from God for him to correct them.
The correction of the Lord is a blessed thing. Let's pray. Father God, today, in Jesus' most powerful name, we thank you for what you've given us. We thank you for the truth of Scripture. Father, we thank you for the author of Hebrews that was faithful to show Jesus as not only sufficient but superior to all the things that had gone before. And after Jesus, there is no more. So, Father, help us to walk in that truth that is Jesus. Help us to seek out the flat path, the path of righteousness and the path of peace. And, Father, may we see your discipline as a righteous thing when it occurs in our life. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.